All right. Good morning. I'm excited to uh, be here with you and get to get a chance to ask some uh, questions of uh, Omri and Emily and get to hear. I think the, the thought I love, uh, Melissa was thinking through this just for you ladies to be able to hear from uh, Emily as they're preparing to leave, just to hear what it's like to be a, a wife and a mom and just the, the kind of truths she's been meditating on, how they've been preparing themselves to go. So before we get started, I'd love to hear, just for the ladies that don't know you, just tell us about your family, how many kids you have, how long you guys been married. <laughs> My wife is the uh, the speaker of the two, <laughs> as you'll find out. But uh, yeah, so we've got, we've been married 11 years, just over 11 years, um, five children, Chloe, who's nine, Obadiah, seven and a half, Jonah, is five, Ezekiel is four, and Nishan, who is two tomorrow. Tomorrow, I didn't know that. Yep. Nasty, all right. <laughs> all right, we'll have a party at the house. Uh, so tell us just, uh, you guys have been gone for about six weeks, right, on the road. So can you, before we kind of dive into the questions, you want to tell us just about your trip, what you were doing, maybe some highlights? stopped in different TDS churches and campuses along the way to just for Omri to spend time with different elders and different ministry leaders and we got to spend time with really sweet families and um, churches and then we're back. I guess that about sums it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. We um it was a good time as a uh, I'm replacing myself here and sort of handing off lots of ministry responsibilities. This was a unique uh, period for us to just get away, for me to uh, glean what I could from other ministries and the leaders at those ministries. And so it was um, lots of driving. We, we spent time uh, in Houston, uh, Spring, Texas, with uh, Richard Caldwell at Founders, uh, Baptist Church. We actually got to stay with John in April for those uh, six weeks. Um, or I said six weeks, for a week of the six weeks. Um, we went from Houston to a few days in New Orleans, one night in Atlanta. We went from there to Lynchburg, Virginia, stayed with Clay and Mary Mackey for like six days. Went from there. Um, I preached twice in New York. Uh, I was invited by another church planter, Joey Gonzalez, who's in New York, to preach for a friend uh, of a another like-minded church in the city. Um, two different Sundays. So I preached uh, Psalm 1 and then Psalm 2. And then that second Sunday after I preached Psalm 2 at that church, walked to Joey's church, preached Psalms 1 and 2, uh, and we got to spend time with them and a little bit in New York. Went from there to Winston-Salem uh, with Kevin Wong and his family, who, funny enough, he's another TES grad serving at the church in Winston-Salem. They have kids the exact same ages as ours, so 10 children, same ages. You can imagine the uh, chaos. And fun. Yep, same same order, right? One girl and then four boys. It was really crazy. Um, anyway, we ended our time uh, after that in Orlando, but then Jupiter. Uh, some of y'all know um, Mark and Samantha Axtell. We spent uh, how many days? Eight or nine days with the Axtells hanging out uh, at GIBC, so... And then we booked it to get back here. And we didn't almost make it, Melissa. We, our car broke down <laughs> in Louisiana. So in Sulphur, Louisiana. Sulphur, Louisiana. Who knew <laughs> that that was even a place? Oh, you didn't. T you didn't tell Melissa about that. No. Oh, okay. Nope. <laughs> Only if we didn't make it back yeah. were you gonna know. <laughs> so here we are. Super happy to be home, and uh, it's just been super sweet seeing seeing folks so far. What's the uh, what's the timeline from today until you leave? What's the next couple months look like, and when are you planning on being in New Orleans? We've got 13 weeks uh, basically from from now until 
departure date. Our last Sunday is October 29th, uh, our last Sunday here. And then there's, um, we'll, we'll basically be on the road uh, moving, or I say moving. Who knows how we get all of our stuff from here to New Orleans. That's still in the air. But somehow, some way, by God's grace, we're going to be in New Orleans November 12th, and, and on November 12th, I plan on opening God's word for whoever's gathered, whoever's there um, in New Orleans East. That's great. It's exciting. And inside, we got a little preview of them being gone for six weeks. Didn't, didn't like it, so it's going uh, to be sad but sweet. So I think it'd be helpful for, uh, just for the ladies here, the ones, some of them that maybe don't know you, you as well, just to hear your, both of your stories, just how the Lord saved you, how he brought you up to this point. Emily, if you want to go first. Um, I was raised in a believing home uh, with parents that loved the Lord, loved his word, taught us his word. It's really sweet. It's really sweet now to see them teach our kids God's word. It's a blessing. Um, and I, like, I think the testimony of most people that were raised in the church, I said a prayer when I was five years old because I didn't want to go to hell and thought that that made me good enough and made me a believer and it did not, and as I got older, I started to develop my own desires and, and idols in my heart, and I just started living this life away from my parents that was different than a life I lived at home, and um, that all came to a head when I was younger, and I, um, it was, yeah, but I ended up at a, at a church camp when I was in junior high, and I don't remember anything about the camp or the speaker or anything else. I think he had a mustache, and that's all I remember. Um, but he, one sermon, he spoke about what your life would look like if you were a Christian, and I realized that my life did not look like that, um, that I, I must not be a Christian if my life doesn't look like that. And so um, that's when the Lord, I think, saved me. He just broke, broke me of my, my, broke my heart, showed me my sin, and I just didn't want to live that way anymore. And so um, after that, just saw a change in my heart, desire for God's word, desire to be with his people, and um, then I, I came to GBC when I was like almost 19 and I've been here ever since. So, yeah. Thank you, Krista. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, similar to Emily, I grew up in, uh, in the home of believing parents in New Orleans and uh, heard the gospel from a young age, prayed a prayer when I was six, I was baptized shortly after that, and um, was a was a decent kid didn't get in much trouble um and outside of you know laziness in school I did pretty good um and so really in private uh when my parents weren't around I did whatever I could get away with that I thought they wouldn't find out about and so finally in, in college uh, when I left New Orleans to go to school in Georgia. My sin, I had new freedom to sin in new ways. And uh, really a couple years in, started to realize that uh, the same things that I feel guilty about because I have this informed conscience because of my parents and how I was raised, I knew the things that I was doing was wrong, uh, but was powerless to stop them. I, I enjoyed them. Um, even in my guilt, I looked forward to the next time that I would get to engage in those same sins. And so while I'm feeling that tension and realizing that that's basically my life, uh, I heard the gospel clearly articulated. And again, similar to Emily, at this conference, um, it was a, a conference that I attended with some friends from another city. Uh, it was in Muscle Shoals, Alabama. The conference was on church discipline. And uh, these men just opened up God's word and taught about salvation. Um, there, were, there were sermons. There was a series of sermons on justification, sanctification, and glorification. Uh, what is church discipline? How to navigate the complexities of church discipline? Uh, creating a culture in the church that... Uh, helps to root out false converts, preach a genuine gospel where people are actually saved. So you encounter people who are 
desiring church discipline, avoiding church discipline because they're living holy lives. And uh, I was just convicted from the preaching that weekend as I heard the gospel clearly articulated that uh, I need to really examine my life. Uh, one of those mornings, I, I read through the book of First John and from chapter 3 was convinced that uh, I'm either not a believer who needs to repent and trust Christ for salvation, or I am a believer who needs to repent and trust Christ for salvation. And so the, you know, what I should do was, was clear to me. And so uh, the, the next few days, the, the Lord really just broke me and uh, caused me to, to do just that. I, I repented, asked God for mercy, and four months later, I was, I was here in Tempe at Grace Bible Church. How did that happen? Uh, my brother, uh, who used to attend our church, um, was already here, um, just benefiting from everything he was hearing. I was already learning from what was being taught at this church. Uh, he was sending sermons and uh, book recommendations while I was still in school. And so this was like the church that was already feeding me in, in some ways uh, before I got here. And so I came here and moved in with him and started uh, getting discipled here. And tell us uh, the path from there then till, you know, desire to, to plant a church in New Orleans. What did it look like from four months after your stay of being in this church and then pretty quick a desire to church plant? How, how has that process been for you guys? So that was 2008, and I um, that weekend when, when I was hearing the preaching that I was hearing, uh, as God was working in my heart, I was thinking at the same time, people are not getting this in New Orleans. People are not hearing this in New Orleans. And so with, in all of my ignorance about church planting and ministry and pastoring, I just knew I want to get, I want people to hear that in New Orleans. And when I got, came here, started build, uh, had the elder qualifications, clearly articulated in build, started reading my Bible for myself and my own growth for the first time. And Smed, not long after that, in 2009, preached the uh, series on missions, Glory Gospel, Church World, you know, became our articulation of a philosophy for missions. And so just between all of those different aspects of ministry, it started coming together, oh, New Orleans is is missing that, a church, a uh, clear articulation of the gospel, men who can handle God's word, which re requires training. And so the, the pieces started to form for me, and I realized New Orleans needs a church, not just a single dude who's excited about the gospel, wants to go street preach. And so I started to, to set my sights on planting in New Orleans, and then... 2010, 2015, and then 2018, I got to our sit down with the elders in like a, a focused way to say, yes, help me think through how to put a church in New Orleans. And so in 2018, that became a tangible plan with a timeline and um, sort of a, a path over the next few years. Then we announced that, as many of you know, in 2021, as a formal endeavor. And if you haven't listened to that mission series on our website, uh, that for me, I mean, I listened to it two years after we started coming here. Uh, and it, it's just was so impactful, transformational, just to see what is, what is God doing in the church around the world or in the world he is doing through the local church. Uh, and, you know, just seeing Amory and Emily just embrace that. I mean, they love, they love the church. They love God's people. Uh, Emily, I'd love to hear from you just, what that has looked like. Obviously, that seems like, as far as I understood, you guys started dating. That was kind of a package deal. You have to go to New Orleans. H how has that looked for you over the years from dating Omri to working through some of those things and being a wife of a church planner? Well, he broke up with me because I didn't want to go to New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't the know first, that. The first time around. <laughs> um, that was the only worthy reason. There were, there were worse reasons. <laughs> um, no, it's when we started dating this, second time um that was just that was just it you know like it was just I was choosing 
to do that if I was going to marry Armin. So that was that's always been what's been in front of me. Um, and so it really it has been years and years and years of just shepherding my heart to actually desire that and want to go. And that's just been, yeah, refining from the Lord and lots of hard conversations, but God is faithful. So. Yeah, it's been sweet just hearing both of you are just so resolute. I remember asking Emily a couple of years ago, like I remember this conversation of just saying, how do you work through thinking about New Orleans? And she was like, well, we're going, I'm going to follow my husband and that's what we're doing. And <laughs> just very, uh, just very faithful in that. So it's been sweet, sweet to watch. But what, for you guys, what have been some of the, some of the hard things to think through, some of the maybe anxieties, how have you worked through some of those things as you're thinking about moving from a place? For Emily, it's only lived in Arizona her whole life. How have you guys worked through some of those things together? And why I have to go first. <laughs> uh, I think for me, right, as a mom, I'm most concerned about safety. Um, my kids being safe, and New Orleans consistently ranks in the most dangerous cities in the country, in the world. Um, and so it's not, I mean, no one thinks, like, where's a really great place to settle down and raise a family? Like, let's go to New Orleans. That's a great place for that. Um, no one thinks that. So for me, my biggest anxiety is being safe. And I've just had to wrestle with not making an idol of that in my heart. Um, I can't guarantee safety anywhere. I can't guarantee safety living here. I can't guarantee safety anywhere. Um, so I can't make idols of things in my heart. That's not helpful. Um, and I think actually taking the gospel to a place where there is so much crime and danger is just an indication of that's actually a city that needs it more than other places. And so um, we should go there. Um, and it's good. It's really sweet for my kids actually to see like, I mean, we live in a a Christian culture in America where it's easy to be a Christian and it's actually I think really sweet for my kids to get to physically see it's costly to follow the Lord you know um, every everyone throughout Christians throughout history have had to pay prices for following the Lord and for my kids to as we talk through it to get to just tell them like this is hard and it's sad and you should be sad because it's it is sad but it is always worth it to follow the Lord even when it's costly um, and it is costly it will be costly so I think that's a blessing, too. Um, just something that uh, I guess more recently has uh, just been a thought in, in regards to the same things that I know are, are temptations to produce fear and anxiety in Emily and my kids especially. Um, just Psalm 3, uh, verse 3, David wrote Psalm 3 when he fled from Absalom. Um, you know, if you're familiar with that story, David's been thrust out of Jerusalem. His son has spent years plotting against him to steal the kingdom. Uh, some of his most trusted friends have turned against him, and now, as the king, he's put back on the run. You know, and life looks like it did before he became king. And so he writes Psalm 3 when he's fleeing from Absalom, uh, who's seeking his life. And he says, but you, O Yahweh, are a shield about me, my glory, and the lifter of my head. Uh, and, and so just David's confidence, and, and, and I think that this, this psalm has been become precious to me, because Dave is not saying this after the dangers passed, and he looks back and he says, oh, God, look how faithful you were. Look what you accomplished. And we can look back and now see with perfect clarity how well you protected us. No, in the moment, David's exhausted, on the run, and he pins the psalm. You know, I mean, what kind of state would you have to be in to write good poetry, <laughs> uh, to write good music? And David did that while his life is being sought for. Um, he even says in verse 1, my adversaries have become many. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. Many, many, many. <laughs> and while his adversaries are many, he's confident in these things, even to the point that 
uh, verse 5 tells you what he did while he was on a run. I lay down and slept. I awoke for Yahweh sustains me. I mean, he didn't, he didn't even break sleep being in this state. And so just uh, that thought being, for me, a comfort that as for David, we serve the same God. So as, that it is that for us. He is that for us. He is um, the one who is the lifter of the head, the remover of shame. He is our glory, and he's, he's our shield. If, if we're going to be protected, God's going to gonna be the one to, to bring the protection, even in New Orleans. And so just, I think, letting that thought produce a, a boldness and a confidence um, in shepherding my family uh, with that thought and articulating those things that, look, we're not any safer um, living in Gilbert with the phrases than we are in New Orleans. The stats might seem that way, but whether we're in Gilbert or in New Orleans East, God's got to be the one who protects us, and he does. And so we can confidently go forward, uh, whatever dangers lie ahead, knowing that we have a, a great and a faithful and a, and a capable God. Yeah, I love, uh, we've talked about this, this uh, John Piper quote where he talks about uh, in missions, the most, most dangerous place to live, he says, is not in some hard place, some unsafe you know, region, but is, is in the suburbs of the United States of America. And he, he talks about Jesus saying, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And just the allure of comfort and those, those things that are actually detrimental to your soul. So it's just sweet to see you guys you know, preach that to yourselves, continue to preach that to yourselves. Uh, so as you guys think about uh, church planning, what are some of the, maybe the scariest parts about it, and what are the, some of the most uh, exciting things as you think about church planting? I think for, I mean, just when you think about what's scary, again, that, that sort of revolves around, uh, you know, what's going to happen to my family, uh, even the thought of, you know, kids having, a community of, of other children, uh, you know, currently that includes the, the Robinsons and Dudleys, but with, you know, just thinking about all of the resources that are here for the kids and, and things that we love and we benefit from, um, for those to, to be removed, we think, okay, what's going to happen to our kids? Uh, long term, do our kids stick around and, and choose to stay in New Orleans? Uh, as they grow up, move out, raise families of their own, do we get to be close to to families? You know, it, this is like a, a long-term endeavor. So I think in terms of the scariest aspects of, of church planting, one of those things being, you know, what happens to my family uh, long-term? Um, are we able to, to raise up more friends, create, uh, a community of people, or is it just a, a couple families for a long, long time, for the next 10 years, you know, where we don't have any other friends outside of, outside of those? Maybe, I don't know. I don't know what the Lord has for me. And so sort of the unknown maybe is, is, is what can, can produce a temptation for me of, of what's scary long term. Um, and then I'll let let Emily speak a little bit more to, to some of those things. But I think outside of like the family, family life, I think of uh, the, the new responsibilities of, of leading a church plant. It's going to be new territory for me. Um, even in, in this season, as we've over the past couple years had to navigate, okay, there's no blueprint for this. Uh, we've got our Bibles in one hand and then Everything else we know about the city and resources here and how do we just bring those two things together, biblical faithfulness and all of the variables uh, that come with getting families from here across the country. And I think that those have exposed uh, weaknesses in my own leadership, uh, a, a need to grow in um, – Faithfulness in, in preaching, consistency in preaching, personal discipline, uh, 
discernment and what to say no to, what to say yes to, not taking on more than I should. I mean, all of that's gonna gonna be uh, accentuated when when I leave Grace Bible Church. And so, for the ministry side, I just feel the um, sort of a, a heightened sense of of urgency and uncertainty and uh, need to really grow and, and strengthen where I might be weak. I think the hardest thing when you think about moving is thinking about leaving GBC. Um, you're talking about taking two other family units to a city where there isn't really a lot of, well, gospel presence, you know? Um, and this church has just been such a blessing. I mean, I started coming here when I was 19, you know, so I've been here almost 20 years. Omri's been here a long time, you know. So you think about taking your kids out of friendships and families that they've loved and grown up with, and you think about taking us out of just the church that's fed us for so many times and, and not having the same type of, of body there to just come around us. But I think what, what I think about, one of the things that I turn my heart to when I, and I start to just be anxious about that is thinking about um, the souls of people somewhere else where it's like, we know the Lord, and we have God's word, and we have his spirit, and so other people don't, you know, like, it's easy to just be comfortable, and it's easy for me to justify my own desire for comfort. It's easy here. We could actually just serve in this church for many, many years, and we could be blessed and grow and, and be faithful to the Lord where we're at, but other places don't have that, so why would we stay? <laughs> why would we stay when there's places that need the gospel and that need a church, you know, um, there's people already here that can serve and preach the word. They don't have people that can serve and preach the word in that same way. And so it's like, if I'm putting the emphasis on the souls of other people, it just makes, it just reminds me that like my desire for comfort to trump those things is just selfish. Um, and I need to just fight that in my own heart to not care more about myself than I care about people that are just really on, on the road to hell, and they need the gospel. So, like, I can fight that by keeping an eternal mindset in that way. Cameron Dodd gets quoted often in our home, in our home. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because she said, um, when you think about going and staying, everybody can't go. <laughs> then Tempe's left without, you know, the gospel that's here in this church uh, and the ministry that flows out of it. But, but she said... Um, well, you say, you say it better. You say it more often. I'm like, Cameron, you probably don't even remember saying it, but, um, it was some people need, people need to go and people need to stay, but not enough people go. And that was just such a good reminder to my heart because it's like, I can go. We have the opportunity to go. So we should, it would just be not, it would be not wise for us to not go. It would be, it would be selfish. So. And there was just something that you said made me think about a conversation we had. Uh, it must have been early August. We were on the cusp of starting year two of seminary. Sarah Demarest came over, watched our two kids and foster kids at the time or whatever, whatever it was. And um, we went out for coffee and, and seminary was hard, you know, and, and especially that first especially year. Especially <laughs> that first year. <laughs> Um, and so there was this moment where I realized, you know, my wife is really not ready for year two. And so we went, sat down and we, we talked and I told her, you know, if you, if you really, if you can't do it, then we shouldn't do it. If we can't do it together well, then we shouldn't do it. Um, but we did have this really sweet conversation about, yes, it's hard. And there are people in New Orleans maybe now, who we, have, we haven't met them, we don't know them, there's no names or faces, but one day they will be so thankful that we endured the second year of seminary uh, and, and whatever else, that hardship that comes and just preparing to go. Um, New Orleans needs a qualified leader uh, who can handle the word and preach with clarity and authority for the long haul, the church needs that. The world needs that. New Orleans needs that. 
And so there are people there who are going to be telling Emily Miles, thank you so much for supporting your husband in whatever challenges came in seminary, you know, and, and in getting there. And so, uh, you know, to think about people one day in heaven because we sacrificed, I mean, that, that really, you know, should we even call it a sacrifice? <laughs> it's, it's so worth it. We're, we're not l- losing in that, in, that, in that sense. You know, we're not giving up. We're actually the beneficiaries of getting to, to give up whatever we must to go bring God's word uh, and to bring God's people, the church, to a new place. It's a privilege. It's ministry in that sense is a privilege. Um, our kids are the beneficiaries of getting to go do this hard thing uh, for the sake of Christ. Yeah, and as I think about you guys with the desire to go, it's it's not that you haven't spent years and years here. You know, your your focus has been on the people of this church, on the ministry of this church, on being trained in this church. Uh, so I'd love just to hear what what are some of the things that you'll maybe miss most you benefited from just the encouragements that you've received uh, from Grace Bible Church. How many years uh, of kind of training, more formal training? I mean, you started seminary. Um, I started seminary in 2015. Um, so yeah, I left teaching and came to work part time here uh, in 2015. So that long. Kind of eight years of eight like years. Yeah. training to, to be yeah. sent. Um, I mean, I think I live my never lived anywhere besides Arizona, so I really love it a lot. Um, my family's here, so like that's hard too for my. I think about for my kids, even like we're just gone for six weeks. We like pull. I like we drop them off there. I drop them off there this morning. We, like, pulled into their driveway, and my kids are, like, screaming. They're, like, so excited to see their grandparents, you know? So, I don't even remember. What was the question? Just uh, Grace Bible Church would have been some encouragements okay. <laughs> about this church. Yeah, I mean, this church really, it's, I mean, it's raised me. I came here in college and quickly found out that I didn't really know all that much about the Lord and his word. And so, I've just been trained over the years by faithful preaching and wonderful women that have poured into my heart and so yeah, yeah everything <laughs> just uh yeah, this i've been raised at this church uh the faithful week after week um heralding of truth that comes from the pulpit uh, i'll miss miss that um going to miss our small group just uh people who I mean that that small group to watch over the years people just so eager to hear God's word um I've just seen tremendous growth in that in in our small group where people are just they just want to be taught you know, just open God's word and, and tell us what it says. Um, every principle, it seems, that uh, I was able to put in front of our small group over the last, uh, however long it's been, since we split from the Demarest, you know, four, four years or so. Um, I mean, people have just taken to it and uh, owned it, and you, you can hear the articulation of things that have been taught at the small group level, sort of matriculating throughout people's lives and uh, produce change. The the fellowship, you know, there's always somebody opening up their home, some sort of event getting hosted. Uh, thank you, Reeds. Um, you know, people just eager to be together often, spending time together, uh, wanting to be a sanctifying influence in each other's lives. I mean, I'm, I'm going to miss that. 
going to miss Sagebrush Coffee. <laughs> um, going to miss just walking in and having, you know, from the minute we hit the door to oftentimes being the last people to leave. Uh, face after face, oh, hey, you know, catching up. Yeah, how's that going? You know, and just nonstop talking until we can uh, get in our van and pull out. Uh, I'll miss my kids running back through the door into my office and, you know, staff meetings on Tuesdays and debriefing with Kyle, spending way too much time talking to Kyle about ministry stuff and when he should be studying, I should be reading something, and we're like hanging out in the office because it's edifying and then we get home, I show up at his house and we're like up way too late talking again, he's supposed to be studying, and I'm like hanging outside the office door trying to go, but he's asking questions, and then I know he needs to study, but then I got another thought. All that'll be. I was a lot more productive the last six weeks. So. <laughs> <laughs> he's got books in his office now. <laughs> so what, uh, what are some of the things you're most excited about? You talked about a lot, of the, a lot of the hard things, but what are you looking forward to in New Orleans, specifically with the church? Yeah, what I'm what I'm looking forward to, um, just getting to to lead a church in a in a new way is exciting. Um, getting to preach every week uh, to the church gathered is is really exciting. Um, I mean, I've seen the effects of faithful preaching in my own life at this church, and getting to to be that for for others. I mean, how many how many of you all when you first came to Grace Bible Church thought, "Oh, I've never been in a church like this. It's so refreshing to finally find a church like this." You know, uh, Lord willing, people will be saying the same thing in New Orleans one day. It's like, oh, man, this is like life to me, and can't wait to hear the word and. That's what that's what I said when I came here, and so I think just uh, being that for others is is really exciting to see a a church where you know men and women marriages are different, uh, parent parents and their parenting are different. Um, to see couples, I mean, I'm expecting in New Orleans East to step into the lives of um, single men and women uh, who need to learn from the ground up. Here's what God says about um, sexual purity. Here's what you should be doing with your, uh, your life in that regard. Here's how you should think about marriage. Here's how you should think about your children and parenting them. Here's how you should think about uh, if you're a single mom, you know, parenting without a man at home. Here's how you can, you know, shepherd your children. Here's what, what to do with just all of these different broken, disordered areas of your life. Here's what God's word says about that. And to see over time, you know, not year one, two, three, or four, five, six, or seven. Year 10, 15, 20 to see uh, men and women who have owned that and are at the point where they're teaching others. Hey, let me tell you how I moved from uh, sexually promiscuous, uh, you know, sleeping around with different women, no appetite for reading or for God's word or being faithful at work. <laughs> Let me tell you the biblical principles that have changed all of those things for me. And so maybe in 10, 15, 20 years, we've produced some men and women who are 
able to step into the lives of others and say, here's what you need to know from God's word and, and how you should think about, about life under Christ's authority. I'm eager to see that. I think, I mean, ultimately, right, I just want to be useful to the word wherever that is, whether it's in Tempe or whether it's in New Orleans, I just want to be useful. My life re realistically isn't going to look that different in New Orleans than it's going to look here. I have five kids to raise and homeschool, and so my days aren't going to be all that different. Um, but to just be useful, I just want to be useful to the Lord. He gives us one life, um, and I want to use it well. I want to use it um, without thinking about myself, but thinking about others and, and serving the Lord and, and honoring him. So. What what does a, a church plan? We talk about church planning. Like, what is the what are the activities of a church plan? Like, what do you guys week one, you know, month one, year one? What is what is church life going to look like? Um, you know, the the second Sunday that we're there, you know, when the people who are really excited to be there the first <clears throat> the first week, like my parents and and others. You know, when, when that's not there, we settle in, and, and it's week, you know, six, and, and nobody's showing up except people who actually want to be at the church um, and are, you know, however that works out. Uh, I think the, the biblical priorities have to be uh, preaching and teaching and training men. So you think about the activities, you know, we won't have children's ministry. Um, there won't be a build or a wellspring, you know, no robust women's ministry um, in, in the early days. But really the needs that, that we'll have day one um, are the same needs that we have currently. They're the same priorities. Uh, any church that's going to last and, and be faithful long term has to prioritize those two things, preaching and training men. Uh, and so just building around those priorities, obviously the church has to gather. So we're going to open God's word and we're going to sing. Um, and we're going to practice the one another's, uh, that, that God requires. We're going to love one another, serve one another, pray for one another, bear one another's burdens, um, encourage one another day after day, as long as it's called today. Um, and as God brings other people in who, Lord willing, uh, want those same things, see how the church operates, are thirsty for the preaching that's happening, uh, then we'll try and discern what are the, the new needs that exist among us. You know, if uh, the first person to stick around is a, Single mom with five kids, she's going to need help. She's going to need help parenting and what, everything else that comes with that kind of life. And so we're going to figure out how, how do we serve this lady. Um, and so pretty organic, you know. We won't have programs. Uh, we won't have the things that are familiar to, to this church that's established, but uh, we'll have the essentials and, and we'll pursue those with all the zeal that we can. What does it look like drawing people into the church? I mean, is that more strategic evangelism? Do you door to door? I mean, do you have do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, I've been been asked that a bunch. I think that uh, we need to get there and and get a, our ourselves established initially, uh, and so I think that looks like meeting our neighbors, that we get to know the people closest to us uh, in that close circle. Um, to reach out, hey, here's who we are, we're in the neighborhood, and just start to establish some of those really ground-level relationships. Um, hopefully we, we're not moving around the city. If we can get in a house that uh, we're, we're eyeing currently, but, that, yeah, that means meeting our neighbors first. Uh, and, that yeah, that could look like door-to-door -door evangelism, as we just look at the areas closest and, and build our way out. Um, and who knows what comes through other other relationships, but 
there's going to be opportunities in terms of things happening in the city that we can be discerning. You know, do we do we jump into that when Mardi Gras comes around every year? Do we make a concerted effort to go out and be an evangelistic presence uh, to draw people in um, as we, you know, get our kids perhaps involved in sports or things happening there? ministering, witnessing to families there, letting them see our lives, being hospitable, opening our homes to whatever circles of influence we find ourselves in uh, and just seeing what fruit the Lord produces there. Uh, We could theoretically target college campuses or some other already established organizations like that, but that may be down the road. I'm not... uh, I'm not banking on that, at least early on, but we'll see what the Lord does organically just through us uh, utilizing the smaller circles of influence we have and and go from there. Yeah, I've heard Smed uh, say a lot, just uh, you don't want to send people to the mission field to be church planners if they're not evangelists at home first. And it's, uh, it's sweet to see. I mean, you guys just have done that in a lot of different ways. So I, I'd love to hear maybe just some ways you've strategically thought about that Maybe as an encouragement to the ladies here, just in your sphere of influence that you have here, how you guys have strategically, because I've seen you do that in a lot of different ways, just gone about being proclaimers of the gospel uh, for, you know, moms in the home, people that live in, in Gilbert. Emily could speak to some of the ways that, uh, I mean, you've been influential just as you've cultivated our home being a, a place where uh, it's hospitable. We practice hospitality often. Um, and so even our, our neighbors, before we could tell them who we are and what I do for work, uh, our neighbors were already asking <laughs> if I was a pastor um, just because we constantly had people over. I don't know what their experience was or why they why that connected the dots, but... I mean, in, Emily's been integral in, in just making our home that kind of place. So maybe if you just talk through how you sort of facilitate the ministry that, that actually happens uh, in our life currently, and uh, I can pivot off of that a little bit. I don't know. <laughs> um, I feel like I just try and be obedient to the Lord, you know? Like, I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't really how to answer that question necessarily but <laughs> we've got our we have, opportunities with we, obviously with our kids yeah obviously that's my first sphere of influence is my kids there's five little sinners that run around my home um and so we get to just preach the gospel to them and try and shepherd them and care for them um outside of that even i mean especially since we started homeschooling i don't get out as much as i used to you know so like my time outside of the home really is like here at church um So my primary sphere of influence is my kids. Um, But, I mean, I think that's just, I mean, meeting neighbors is is a great way we had at our our last house, too. We just had a couple families that were just really sweet, sweet families that we just got, I just got to talk with them and help them with their kids and parenting and share the gospel with them and those kind of things. And so I think that that was sweet. Um, And then just, yeah, trying to, I mean, our home has a, we have an open door policy, so it's just, come over whenever you want, whenever, you know, I mean, like, we're not super, yeah, I don't know, yeah, I don't know. It's been kind of funny, even on the road, the, most of the homes that we stayed at, everybody was like the, the young adults uh, ministry leader, uh, and so we just laughed, actually, about how similar all our lives looked, and so, I mean, discipleship for Emily, um, the, the ladies in 414 can attest to this, you know, I come home and and there's like one of the single gals in in our living room hanging out with Emily uh she's just it's like the a normal day and and some of those ladies have just been able to benefit and glean from Emily's wisdom in the normal ebb and flow of of life so you know that that hasn't been able for us to look like hey, let, let me carve out two hours to go grab coffee with you, um, you know, while Omri's at home caring for the kids. Like, that just doesn't happen. 
uh, very often. And so for her, it's, hey, you can come over and watch kids, hang on to these four while I go discipline the one. Um, and the ladies have, in, in one degree or another, gotten to see just normal life and in in it in its own way that is instructive you know that's just a part of of the discipleship so as you think about you know moms in the room some of you with young kids uh i mean i would encourage that you know don't don't isolate your discipleship uh to to one-on-one -on -one meetings only sometimes that's that's necessary uh have people over for meals, put the kids down, talk while you wash dishes, you know, clean up from dinner, um, have people over in the, the normal stuff. And, and that doesn't always look like, well, never looks like uninterrupted time. Uh, and that's okay. Uh, you older ladies, don't be afraid to step into to the chaos, uh, lend a hand, and you know, something that I heard, I can't even remember exactly where I heard it. I think Matt Waymeyer said this at a, a Courageous Churchman conference, but when he thinks about discipleship of others, um, especially as kids, the quality of time often comes from the quantity of time spent. You can't plan a groundbreaking, monumental conversation, but as you just increase the time that you spend with others, then at some point, oftentimes, that yields uh, a quality conversation that can be uh, really impactful uh, for, for the, a long life. And so, I don't know, I think about the opportunities we had, you know, to dis for discipleship and evangelism. They've kind of come by welcoming people into our lives as is and... Uh, God's been, I think, faithful to use that. Yeah, it's been uh, instructive, I think, for me and Ashley just to see you guys uh, just be so kind of open-handed with with relationships, letting people in. I remember just one uh, memory that comes to mind. We were at uh, Joe's Barbecue, I think. This is like four or five years ago. And there's like kids are playing, and there's just this this young family that's over here, and you strike up a conversation. One thing leads to another. You're having them over you know, for dinner on Tuesday night next week. I don't know if you remember this, they're like new to town or something, but just that, it, you know, it is a, it's a disposition that you guys have that's, that's just, hey, we want to invite you into our lives so that we can speak truth to you, so we can love you. Um, so I just think that, I mean, that really is instructive to see how you just, and I think Emily facilitates that in the way that she uh, manages the home and loves her kids, loves her husband and is supportive. So just thinking about home life, you said it might be similar, but what are, what are some differences as you think through New Orleans uh, the city, obviously, New Orleans East, talked about safety. Are there, are there differences in home life, and how have you thought through some of those things? Well, you're going to be working from home more, so that's a difference. <laughs> An adjustment, I don't know. <laughs> Different. I, I don't really know. I, I don't think I've given tons of thought to the differences. I don't know. Have we talked about that? Well, I mean, I think some some differences at home. Yeah, I'll be I'll be working from home. You know, no office space like I have here. Uh, that'll be a a difference. Um, I mean, we're actually considering getting a dog. That's different. We are not pet people, and yet we need some deterrence <laughs> to people who would uh, <laughs> seek to do harm <laughs> or you know, break in. So we're thinking, I mean, we don't need a security system now. We're, that's being budgeted for, you know, we definitely don't need or want a dog. Um, Our kids call the dog that we don't have by its name currently. <laughs> <laughs> so they're set on that. So that's, those are some, some differences. Uh, I mean, you know, to, to give thought, greater thought to where we shop, you know, like, Emily's not going to the Walmart in New Orleans East where they have to even lock up the underwear, you know? Like, so New Orleans, it, we're, we'll be living in a more dangerous city. So uh, those are things that 
that we have to give thought to. Emily is really excited about driving in New Orleans. That's why you're going to be at home. You can drive us two places. <laughs> We're still working we out with together. The <laughs> this turned well, into, yeah, this turned mean, into marriage counseling, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, like, yeah, that's that's a difference that I'm planning for. Is you know, at least at first, we'll we'll do our our grocery shopping together as a family. Um, one, Emily's got to learn her way around. Uh, if you've only if you've grown up here, I mean, you know. It's easy to navigate. 30 minute drive somewhere is not a big deal. In New Orleans, it is just not the same. So um, streets don't connect. They pick up other places. Anyway, it's just different navigating uh, a new place. So that's gonna be a, a significant hurdle even, you know, just learning uh, what stores are good to shop at, you know, even, um, yeah, not uncommon to see police cars outside of grocery stores and places close become known for uh, violent events. And so we just got to learn to navigate that and, hey, what, what level of danger are we comfortable with? And um, where do we go for these things? What do we... And we have talked about that. I just blinked when you asked the question. We have had those conversations. <laughs> yeah. Um, So how have you helped yeah. just uh, think about preparing kids for, for that, for leaving, for all those things? What do those conversations look like, just trying to help? I mean, primarily, obviously, the older two are going to be thinking more about that, but what does that look like in the home? I mean, I think similar to kind of what I already said, they, you know, the kids get really sad, mostly just Chloe. She's like our social butterfly. The rest of the kids are kind of like whatever. Um, but... Um, yeah, just talking with them, you know, and just, I mean, really, like, I think kind of validating how they're feeling, right? Like, they are, it is, it is sad, it is scary, it is, you know, like, those are all new things, and so you're not wrong for feeling those things. Those things are accurate and, and normal, and so we do want to, like, I don't want you to write them off because that's reality, um, but just then, and letting them know that, like, oh, my, I feel all those same things, too. You know, it's not just you. I feel those things, too. It's hard for me, too. Um, but then just pointing them back to the gospel. And, and that's like one of those things that, that I think I say a lot is it is sad, it is hard, but the gospel's worth it. Um, and so it's, it's going to be costly to take the gospel somewhere, but it's always worth it. The gospel's always worth it. And so I think that's kind of like, and we've read, um, we've just read books. Like we had that one book for that. Yeah, people every child should know. And it was just like short story after short story of just different people throughout church history of who's just sacrificed and gone places and have been impactful. And so that's really been helpful for them too as we've just talked through those things. It's been helpful to have friends who've done similar things, uh, harder things before us, um, the cans, <laughs> the dods. I mean, we've sent them, seen them go, the layman's, uh, and so our kids know those kids, and so we pray for them regularly. And so it's not like they have a category for what we're doing already. Um, and I don't what was this, like a, a year ago? We just hit a point, I think, recently, even with Chloe, where we could talk about moving to New Orleans without her crying. You know, it was, uh, I think, several months ago. Um, well, what happened is that we watched all of Mark Ween's food videos about New Orleans, and then after we finished watching all of these videos, Chloe was like, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. <laughs> so, that is, if you haven't, uh, so this is Pam's brother-in-law, is a YouTube food blogger. Oh, her brother, sorry. Derek's brother-in-law. Uh, and uh, a great way to get to know the city. I mean, it's, uh, there's some cool YouTube videos. Um, just having a conversation time and time again, yes, we're going, what are you sad about? Tell us, you know, just leaving an open path for, for conversations about that. Um, reminding them, yeah, often about why we're going. And, uh, you know, I've had one-on-one -on -one conversations with 
Chloe and Obi, uh, you know, do you do you want to not go? How do you you know? How are you thinking about going? Do you? Why do you tell me why you think we're going to just give them opportunities to articulate so I can sort of get in their shoes, get in their minds a little bit, and know what they're hearing. Um, and then we've just had like events, right? Significant events. Moving out of our house, moving in with the Frazies, um, going back to our home, cleaning up on a Sunday because people were going to rent it through Airbnb. And uh, those have just been moments where there's been like uncontrollable sobbing uh, from one kid. And I think that it's been helpful to have the other kids present for that. Because, you know, some of our young ones who aren't, don't feel things the same way go, oh, why is my big sister, big brother so sad? Oh, that's why they're crying. I kind of feel that too. And so it's almost like the, as one kid jumps into this giant pool of sadness, you know, the others get splashed on and they feel it a little bit too. And so... That's helped, I think, solidify what we're doing, why the the significance, and um, they sort of sh have been able to share in that sadness together, and, and we all have. We've cried together, and um, that's just been good for us as a family. I remember we were at, uh, in New Orleans with you guys, at this Nola Baptist Church, which is a church on the other, kind of other side of town, and they've been at it for seven years, maybe? 10 years, a long time, and the, the pastor, his two kids are the only two kids in the church, 15, 30-person church, and he was just talking about, they left a similar kind of bigger church, sweet ministry, and he was just talking about the privilege it was for his daughters to be on the kind of the front lines of ministry to get to to see, you know, they're, they're watching their dad evangelize guys on the street, and they're getting to bring people in their home, and they're getting to see that, so it was it was sweet to hear him just talk about that's a you know, all the challenges, and with that is the the privilege of just getting to see God at work uh, in this church and the lives of people, and it doesn't make it any less hard, but it's sweet to think about those things. Um, what are uh, what are some of the ways, just for the ladies here, for the church to both to, to pray for you in the next, think about the next three months, and then to just to care for you guys to help send you off well? I think that I don't have any doubt that we'll be sent off well. You know, like, um, I think what would be most helpful is what comes after the send-off. Um, you know, it's just probably going to cry. I was crying on the way here listening to a kid's worship song, so it's not, like, it's not a good omen for, like, right now. <laughs> um, but I think what comes after is what's most helpful. Um, because we are leaving everything we know. And there's always like an initial like influx of like help and communication because it's new. Uh, but when the dust settles and we're in a different city and it's Pam and Brittany and Judy and I, you know, um, that's when it's going to be harder. And that's when we're going to need the help and the shepherding and the care and the love. Um, but again, I wouldn't not choose that. I wouldn't not choose it because there are souls and there are lives at stake. And so my, you know, well, how hard it is for me is nothing compared to the fact that there's people that need the gospel. And so you just go. Um, yeah, so anyway, um, I think praying for us, getting ready to go, there's like a lot of moving pieces um, with houses and cars and buying houses and selling houses and figuring out how to get all of our stuff to New Orleans. Um, there's moving pieces there. Um, but praying for us is helpful. Um, and then being trying, just staying in communication with us, that's really helpful. And then visiting us. We still will have an open door policy in New Orleans, so you can come anytime um, and visit us. That's really helpful, too. But just not losing that that landline because um, the body is so helpful. But 
there's so many people that don't have a body. So, like, we want to do that and be that. So. Yeah, I was, uh, I, don't, I don't know if Smith's here, so I'll, I'll talk about him behind his back. But he was just talking about you guys and just saying, hey, the next next three months, I want to be as close to Amory and Emily as I can, to care for them as much as I can, to send them out as well as we can as a church because, like, it's going to be a long haul. You know, it's different. You know, we sent out Gilbert Bible Church in a really sweet way with a just a, I mean, you have several pastors, you have deacons, you have a just a, a really thriving body. Uh, and he was just saying a different, you know, you guys, this is going to be a different kind of ministry. So there's similar to what the cans are doing just to have the church come alongside and care for you guys uh, over years, you know, as you're plowing and just being faithful and are going to need encouragement. And, you know, I'm already planning a, a youth group service trip out there so we could uh, come out there and help you guys, you know, maybe next summer, summer after. Uh, so what about you, Amri? What do you think about this thing? Is just to encourage you guys, pray for you guys in this next season. Yeah, you can just pray for uh, my faithfulness. Uh, it is it is a marathon. It, it'll be that. And just pray for. Uh, I feel like the you know one thing you can pray for me is is yeah faithfulness faithfulness to uh, shepherd this flock. Uh, in New Orleans well to not get bored with uh, less you know um, I, I get to wear lots of hats and you know get to be involved in lots of activity here and uh, there's a just a danger with um, getting bored with doing little uh, having fewer responsibilities, and so uh, I don't want to do that. I want to put my hand to the plow, uh, make the most of um, the opportunity, less responsibilities. Um, so faithfulness in those in those things is what you can pray for me. But I f- I also think that the 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 best thing you could <laughs> you could do for me is care for my family. Um, you know, Emily just. By virtue of being a woman and who she is specifically, the way God's made her, just we feel distance different, uh, differently. And uh, to to have people visit or reach out with a text, a phone call, um, that that's gonna uh, produce a different impact for her even than me. You know, um, so if if she's encouraged, then I'm I'm well. <laughs> yeah, I think it just just as a I mean the way that the ladies in this church do so well. Just a reminder, just to just to care well for Emily in this season. Now, before she leaves, after she leaves, uh, come alongside her because there's just it's it's like you've been saying it's a it's a hard thing, it's a sad thing, uh, and she just needs to be cared for, loved, prayed for. I uh, was just thinking about uh, Jill Drent. He was new here, if you haven't met Jill. Just went through the the same thing in a different way to come here and leave behind kids. So uh, it's just good for us to remember that. There's people that, that just need a, a special kind of care. Um, and that's what the body of Christ does. That's what you women do so well. Um, I'd love to hear, Omri, from you as you think about just Grace Bible Church, being a pastor in this church. Uh what are you hoping for this church? You know, if you come back a year from now, three years from now, ten years from now. And I'd, I'd love to see uh, the same kinds of things that are happening here happening, um, and even better. You know, to excel still more for this church to still be doing the same things, preaching the word. Uh, training men and women, uh, discipleship happening, I mean, uh, raising up biblical counselors, like, if those things are still happening 10 years from now, um, and if, not not that they're just happening, but if there's a, a greater zeal, a greater clarity, um, if those things are happening to a greater degree and more efficiently, like that would just be an incredible blessing. And that'll be a, a blessing for New Orleans um, to know, to, to watch this church, the sending church, 
continuing to do well, continuing to raise up missionaries and send people out. I mean, in a, in a very real way that, that benefits the people being sent from this church. Uh, if you think of this church as a, a hub that's holding the rope, lots of different ropes for, for different men and women who've been sent, uh, we need this church to remain strong uh, so that as we, you know, using William Carey's analogy, are, are going down into, into the mine uh, that there's a strong uh, sender still up top that's, that's going to be a, a great benefit. And so as moms, as wives, as friends and, and those who disciple, uh, we need you ladies just uh, growing in the Lord and applying God's word and uh, being sanctified here so that you grow in godliness and uh, impact all of the spheres of influence that you have, you know, the your husbands at home, your children, um, your counsel, your ability to step into hard things and counsel others. We need you be, to be able to do that. All of that helps the shepherds of this church, uh, helps the leaders at this church so that the people that they've sent, that we've sent as a body, uh, can also be served. Um, if, if you all fall apart today and need shepherding, then that changes the emphasis, uh, removes resources from the missionaries and people who've been sent out from here. And so um, just we can't say enough. I can't say enough about the value of godly women here, um, women who fit the, the mold of Titus 2, um, are not, you know, thinking about 1 Timothy 5, not slanderous gossipers, and uh, are humble, teachable, uh, able to teach what is good as godly women should. We need, we need that coming from the women here at Grace Bible Church. That's good. Um, I was thinking about when the, the Twombly's were here, talking to them before they left. I think uh, Kara had said, Brian's wife, and the Twombly's are a family that came to this church for six months, was sent out to uh, to serve alongside where the laymans are at in, in Papua New Guinea. And I think everyone asked her, you know, are you excited to go? Are you excited to go? And uh, I just remember them saying, you know, it's not, we're not excited, but uh, we're not excited to leave everyone we know and love, but, you know, but a different kind of uh, excitement. So what's like, I'd love to hear just kind of as we're wrapping up, what are some of the kind of the the passages, the burdens, the things that just kind of come to the top of your mind to kind of keep, and you've shared some of those, but just to keep that uh, the right kind of, a, not a not an excitement to leave, but a, but a zeal to, to do the work. Um, there's, there's three things that come to my mind often that I remind myself of, and one of them Omri shared is what Cameron had said, um, not enough people go. Um, that's been like, Super helpful for me to just think like I need to go. We need to go. Um, but I read I don't know a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago. I read Becoming Elizabeth Elliot, and we all like know one from are familiar with Elizabeth and Jim Elliot. But just seeing her like her husband was killed, and then her almost immediate thought was these people need the gospel, and so she took her child her infant child and went and lived in the jungle with these people that just killed her husband because she wanted them to know the gospel and that was that's just I mean she could have been and totally justified in saying well that's a wrap like my husband has been killed we need to we need to head home I have a baby you know like but she didn't she chose that would have been the easier choice and she chose what was hard she chose hard and she chose faithfulness and she went and because of that you know because of the Lord used her there's people in heaven with Jim that killed him, you know? Like, I mean, just thinking, like, that's amazing. Like, I would rather choose what's hard over what's easy for the sake of people's souls in eternity. Um, so that's something I call to mind a lot to think about. And the other thing that I think about, and there was, it was one Sunday here, and it was the Sunday that Scott gave us, like, an update on Finisterre and, like, the direction it was going and team a and those things, and then an equipping hour, which 
I guess this should be a plug for come to equipping hour if you don't come. It's amazing. Um, but so Scott did that in equipping hour, and then John t was teaching through Mark. And so, and that day he was teaching. It was just a passage about the disciples, and he just taught where all the disciples had gone um, after you know from Jesus, and they they really obeyed that instruction to go to the ends of the earth um, that Jesus gave them at the end of Matthew. And so Matthew, Mark, whatever I don't know. No, no, never mind. Never mind. Um, but they obeyed that instruction to go. You know, and just the like I think the dual impact of those two lessons together. It just sparked in my heart this question of, is there somewhere that I'm unwilling to go for the gospel, for the sake of the gospel? If there's somewhere that I say, that's too far, I won't do that, then I need to check my heart because there shouldn't be anywhere that I say, I'm unwilling to do that for you, Lord. You know, like, um, and that was just, so I think about those things a lot where it's like, those three things have just been so helpful and they just put my heart back on track when I start to, to drift. Um, so for me, that's just, Uh, just uh, one passage that has uh, haunted me since I think we we talked about it in in seminary. I tell the story often, but just um, I remember one one day we had to translate Second Timothy four uh, verses one and two, and you know it was it was uh, I think an all nighter. One of those times that I had to pull an all-nighter, and we had to translate it, parse all the words, diagram it um, in the Greek. We got we get to class with Smed. I'm exhausted. He's having us build out the diagram on the board, and so we're walking through this whole exercise, and then um, you know we we get only through verse one as long as that took. Paul says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom. And so, you know, to have to walk through slowly that whole process, I mean, the whole board, uh, what is now the TES room, was like full of a Greek diagram. And just the weight of the command in that moment um, I had forgotten by that time what the actual charge was. And it was like, man, whatever Paul's about to say is super important. And I look back down at my diagram and I'm like, what, what's the command? What's the imperative? Preach the word. And from that moment, I mean, I, that passage has just haunted me and encouraged me and I think even in this season has been a renewed uh, zeal uh, for preaching and so as I think about going to New Orleans I mean just to think about the priority that God puts on his word um, the scriptures are sufficient he says in chapter 3 16 and 17 and so with no breaks He's charged, Timothy is, to preach that sufficient word. And so that's what I want to do. I want to be faithful, um, and I want to lead well in the church and in, in, in preaching. And so I uh, want God to just use that uh, to do all that he's done. And as I mentioned before, to not, to not get bored with uh, week after week uh, what goes into that. And so that's uh, just – one of the, the passages that I think as I go think about everything that we're going and doing, um, to just have that confidence that this is God's view of, of his own word preached. And so I can, I can trust him uh, as I just go faithfully endeavor in doing that. Well, thank you guys. That was really a hopefully encouraging time. That was sweet. Hey, uh, next time I would ask for tissues up here when Emily's talking. It's pretty sweet. <laughs> You guys, any uh, any last last words? Anything else you want to say? Oh, the book was uh, "People That Every Child Should Know." I can't remember if we have copies of that at the book table. If we don't, we should. Um. But it's a kid's book that just 
it's a page with a picture of a of a figure from church history and then the next page just gives you a a one quick summary of their life and and why they're important all right well i'm gonna close our time by praying for you guys and then i think melissa is going to come back up and give give some lunch instructions but let me uh let me pray for you guys as we close god i just uh thank you for uh just your grace uh, that's on display in the lives of Omri and Emily. I thank you for sustaining them. I thank you for saving them. Uh, and just the the ministry that they have done so faithfully at this church, the impact on so many souls uh, in this in this body, Lord, uh, just eternal fruit for the sake, Jesus, of your name. Um, we just pray for them that you would continue to sustain them. We pray that you would be near to them in this season, and we pray that you would strengthen them, Lord, with a, an otherworldly strength just to be uh, zealous about the work that is in front of them, Lord, to be uh, resolute, to be uh, steadfast in the face of uncertainty and uh, trials and discouragements and even changes and uh, just all the things that, that have come at them that will come at them, Lord. Uh, and we just pray that you would be near to them. Uh, Jesus, you, you promise to, uh, to be near to us, that you are with us in this uh, Great Commission endeavor. So I pray that they would just uh, embrace that promise, that they would uh, just know your presence, Lord, that they would see uh, just much fruit. And uh, we pray for uh, fruit in New Orleans, uh, not for them, uh, but for you, Jesus, so that your name would be exalted in a, a dark place, so that uh, moms and dads and children and families would change uh, because of the gospel, Lord, and that that would have uh, an impact on a community, so that they would see, Jesus, uh, just the power of your gospel, the power of your grace, your goodness, uh, your character would be on display, Lord. Uh, we just pray for uh, just five sweet, sweet children, Lord. We think about uh, Chloe and Obi and Jonah and Zeke and Nash. Uh, just pray that you would sustain them. Lord, help them just to be uh, able to roll with all of the things that they have to go through, Lord. I uh, pray that Amr and Emily would care for them, uh, would encourage them, would uh, just be faithful to even discipline, instruct them, Lord. And we just pray for salvation. Pray that this uh, even this endeavor would just have such impact on their souls, on their hearts, uh, as they see their parents uh, just be faithful to you at uh, a great cost. Um, so we just pray, Lord, for all these things. Pray that we can, uh, as Paul says in, uh, in Acts 20, that we would be able to entrust uh, these sweet friends of ours to the word of your grace. Lord, we know that you love them more than we do, so we pray that you would just uh, just care for them in this season. We love you. We just pray for this conference. Pray for these women. Pray that they'd be uh, edified and strengthened. Pray that relationships would grow. Um, just thank you for food. I pray that we would eat lunch with thankful hearts, to, Lord, and we would do it all as uh, worship unto you. Pray these things, Jesus, uh, in your mighty name. Amen.